<laughs> to learn. But that is basically everything for me. I will hand over to you guys. Um, once we're done, if you would like to buy books, please do. And um, we are giving away bracelets for Mother's Day this weekend. Oh. So before you leave, please choose a bracelet to take with you. Them. And then like walk around and have it catch the light and do beautiful things. Mm -hmm. So cool. that's it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you and welcome. Um, I've, I think, discussed with him push uh, wanderers, I think, three times. Yeah, <laughs> well, we've been doing this quite some time now. It, it, it's because you're the only person that won't charge me to discuss with me. So that's why I'm always asking you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my third installment but what I thought I would do differently is that I thought I would try and mix the two books uh, Broken River Tent and wow. The Wanderers and then let's so just talk to each other yeah. <laughs> since they, they are obvious connections the other reason of course is that uh, this book is being published in the US and Canada this week Yay. So, which is a uh, massive achievement and uh, I'm very proud that uh, it is being published uh, in that jurisdiction. Let's see how it does there. It's done very well in South Africa. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have anything to say um, to introduce yourself or to introduce the discussion? Yeah, there's uh, first of all the only thing to say, first thing to say guys, thank you very much for coming. I know how Saturday mornings are. Some of us who do things that involve <laughs> fiery waters, Saturday mornings are very difficult. I was talking with, uh, <coughs> with Griffith when he said about 11. I was like, oh, Lord, 11 <laughs> on a Saturday. <laughs> but uh, I'm here, and I'm fresh as a daisy. <laughs> Thank you, guys, uh, especially also again for the Jonas Beck Book Club. Uh, she's, uh, they are partly our hosted because they're also they are here and also my people <laughs> now they've become my people yes. the, the, bit, the between the covers uh, book club there i see some of, of their members here also we had a wonderful discussion with them last week and um, it was really nice because there was wine so <laughs> and the, the tongue was loose <laughs> perhaps today the tongue will be a little bit formal because I I, de I deliberately uh, do it this way deliberately because one of the things Tembega and I share is the love of the frontier history. So uh, most probably don't get too bored when this one becomes a little bit too historical. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, the reason also why we wanted Opumez and the Jonas Beck uh, book club so that they can bring us to the love stories of the wanderers also. Yeah. And so, so that they don't they don't get skipped over yeah. and all those things but uh, thank you to everyone who's here for coming guys it's a it's a wonderful uh, morning also in Joburg thank you um, we have I think an hour and a half uh, if I'm not mistaken um, so I would try for us to have a conversation for about 25 minutes and then to have a further conversation uh, in the remaining 45 minutes. Uh, so Mpush, you know, I usually sort of prepare for these things, even though I've done them several times, I still write my notes on <laughs> why that happens. Let's start with uh, Broken River Ten. I mean, both your books, uh, they've got these two male characters. Uh, there is Pax in The Wanderers, and then there is Pila in The Broken River Ten. Um, both of these are Eastern Cape uh, <laughs> characters. The one disappears uh, to exile. Um, the other one comes back from Germany after uh, nine years and speaking a bit of German. Uh, and then sort of tries to say, well, who am I? You know, what's my identity? Uh, and then gets into this long conversation with, uh, with Makoma. Um, and then Makoma then takes him deep into the frontier history. Uh, early 19th century, late 19th century, fascinating stuff, all of the wars that Makoma was engaged in. Um, but Pax is being uh, uh, sought by his daughter because 
before he left, he had planted a seed. <laughs> but <laughs> but, uh, but his daughter is, you know, has this strange relationship with the mother who raised her. And, uh, and it's a very odd thing, you know, the person who actually raises you, you know, doesn't have the same impact on you. Like, uh, uh, there's a line in, 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 in The Wanderers, you know, I think, it, I think it's, or is it your dedication uh, to those parents who stay? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's the dedication. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you talk about that first? I, yeah. I'm just talking now about this book. Yeah. But maybe you should talk, you are the writer. <laughs> Can you just talk about this idea of a parent who stays? Yeah. Because there's a lot of loss and longing and, uh, in, yeah. in The Wanderers. Yeah. I mean, there's loss in The Broken River Tent too. But you don't feel the sort of deep personal loss that you feel when you read uh, The Wanderers. Uh, there's a lot of emotion. And I suppose, uh, I don't want to use femininity, but there is a strong femininity in, in The Wanderers, which mm. you don't really feel in, uh, in The Broken River Tent. Mm. Yeah. Can you just talk about that first? I mean, how does it feel like uh, yeah, yeah. as a sort of uh, writer to put yourself in the shoes you've never really <laughs> worn? Yeah. yeah. Thanks, th thanks for that wonderful uh, <coughs> introduction. I was thinking I should have helped uh, for the benefit of the people who have not read the books, do a, a short introduction of the books. I couldn't have done it better. <laughs> um, uh, the one thing perhaps I should reveal is, which uh, I think my readers have picked up, I kind of wrote the books simultaneously. Uh, I have a very wandering mind. I'm restless. So I can't concentrate on one thing at a time, <laughs> you understand? So my, my mind is always wandering. So what I was doing basically was like, if I have uh, something that I felt didn't fit on the Broken River Tent, I will put it on the manuscript of uh, Wanderers. And uh, <coughs> another thing, I, I, then I didn't call it a manuscript, I called it an overflow. Like it was an overflow from that book. But then later on, uh, I had to, uh, there's another thing I, I must reveal, which most people don't know. And uh, the, the manuscript I actually finished first was The Wanderers. Mm. And then I sent it to the publishers, it was rejected. <laughs> you understand? And then I said, okay, I put it aside and, and I'll, I'll, I'll work it out uh, later on. I'm kind of happy that it was, because the things that it talks about that book, are clearer now, whereas uh, earlier on, they are now I'm talking about being disappointed in our liberators and all that stuff. So now we're all feeling that. So I think that is why the wanderers is resonating now more than it would, it would have resonated perhaps if it had uh, been the first book, yeah, not before the, the Broken River turned. So uh, the sense of longing and the sense of loss, uh, I like that because when I also read your books, I get that uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about the Broken River Ten now, because it, it's it's about the history of Amakosa and how they were invaded into a crisis by a foreign power, which is the British, and then all those things, and then basically lost their self-sustenance as a nation, which we have not uh, recovered even today from. So that's the loss I was I was I was, I was trying to address uh, with Amakosa. And then there is this sense uh, of us who never live the history or who doesn't read the history of thinking in Doba, uh, our, our ancestors just gave up the land. Hey guys, we had ancestors. And that land was not, gave up, was not given up uh, easily. Mm -hmm. The British themselves have never fought a longest war like they fought with the Marcos. That's the longest war they've ever fought, 102 years, a decade and two years. You understand? So that land was not just given up. We had... Uh, a century. Yeah. <laughs> so, so a century, yeah. So, um, and uh, it, it, it took nine major wars to lose that, 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 uh, that land. And uh, among those major wars, four of them were led by the Prince Makoma, who was a prince of uh, uh, Amang Nguyga, uh, Nguyga's son. So, um, initially when I was trying to write uh, The Broken River Tent, I wanted my protagonist to be a a, <laughs> a, 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 a a normal person. I didn't want to, to, to it to be a hero kind of thing. But uh, my coma was unavoidable. 
because when you read the, as you know, when you read the, 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 the frontier history, the, the journals of the soldiers, the British official books, the journals of the missionaries, the one name that you come across all the time was Malcolm. He was, he was their boogeyman. You understand? Because he, yeah, he took no nonsense. But the point I'm trying to make is, when I was reading all that history, trying to find out even my own self, uh, my own identity, because unfortunately I discovered this history when I was actually overseas, which I couldn't, I did not know about. And it just flabbergasted me, like, but how come I don't know about this? How come we never been taught about this? So I was reading about it, and then eventually I decided, I, you know, when sometimes you read something too much, you, 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 you form an opinion on it. <laughs> and then, like, what struck me the first thing was, like, in all this history, the only thing that is missing is talking about from the closer point of view. You understand? I was like, it's yes, yeah, the missionaries, everybody, everybody, they, they have an opinion. There's not a, 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 the closer point of view is just one sentence, one sentence. And everybody was talking about this chief Yamakosa, Yamakos, which was my comma, was a, a, a very good uh, speaker and all those things. And then I was like, oh, okay, this is my man. So uh, through it, I will learn how Yamakosa perhaps would have felt according to this. So even if the history was, re was not returning by us, we can see the gaps, uh, uh, even the one that is written by our so-called enemies. And then as a historical novelist, most, our, our thing is to address the unhealthy silences rather than the facts of history. And then bring them in such a way that they are relatable as a story to people who are living now who are not really interested per se in historical facts. So whoever is interested to historical facts will get the idea and go and research it for themselves. Yeah, but um, sometimes, lastly, uh, there's a, uh, I'm learning to discover that there is a difference now between what I call historical fiction and creative history. And uh, I'm much more interested in creative history. I'll tell you why. I do not like books that write about history and then they mess, they, they like, you, you know, sometimes a book introduces something that never happened in history. I don't like that. You understand? Because it's not fair also on people who never read that history because they're going to think that, but, okay, this is, a, this is the truth. You understand? This is a fact. So I don't manipulate facts when I write about history. What I do is inject some emotions and in psychological insight and a, a point of view of my cultural background into it because it is what is lacking on the documents that were written by other people which are white and British. And I'm like, okay, they say it this way, but we, who would have said it this way? You understand? So that is what I was attempting on the, on, on the Broken River Tent. On the Wanderers, you are right when you say, I wanted something more feminine. <laughs> I was like tired of talking about wars and all that stuff. Yeah. So it's very draining, guys, to read our history because it's, it's, it's gruesome. It's really gruesome. And uh, some histories, like for instance, how they killed uh, Amakosa and the Khoi people for white settlers. I mean, we would call that genocide today, what they did there. You understand? So it's very, very taxing to, to, to read those things. So whenever I wanted a break, I'll be like, okay, let me go back. And then this is my only um, thing with, the, with this one with, that became Wanderers eventually. I was like, I want a, 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 a female protagonist. And I want to talk about love. I want to talk about things that don't re necessarily relate into history. <laughs> But then, yeah, I always complicate myself. I, I've, I've just realized that, but in actual sense, I'm almost unable to write uh, without referring to history, because it ended up being a little bit historical yeah. itself. <laughs> yeah, I still want to s stick on this theme of loss. I mean, there's the big loss, you know, mm. the national loss. The, the course has lost many things, the, mm. uh, which is the theme of uh, the Broken River Tent. The Mfengus also lost many things, which is the theme of uh, the Wanderers. But the families also were broken up, and people lost parents. Mm. Um, and there's that uh, sense in, in, the, in the Wanderers. 
that if you want to understand the structure of apartheid and the structure of colonialism, you must also look at the family level and you look at the personal level. Mm. And in a sense, you know, they end up, so you, you are left with one parent, uh, not because of anything you've done, mm. but that parent that raises you, you know, you, you end up not liking them and then longing for something you never had. Mm. I just want to explore that theme that uh, uh, how, how Ruru um, feels about this idea and how it happens that it's weird in a sense, you know, the, the person who sh actually practically shows you love, you know, is not the person you feel, yeah. you know, <laughs> you love, you know, like, it's, uh, yeah. uh, that, was, that was a fascinating uh, insight in the, in the Wanderers. Yeah, I, I think that one, uh, uh, if I might say, comes from personal experience because I was raised by a single mother and uh, when you grow up without your father, you tend to glorify your father. You think your father was a hero, and you think when things uh, happen on you, if your father was around, they wouldn't be happening. People, like even at school, you won't be bullied if your father was here, you, you'll talk to your father. So it's so unfortunate, I realized when I was older that uh, we, we tend to romanticize the, 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 the absent parent to the neglect of the, one, of the one that stayed, who made all the sacrifices and who chose to be here with you and then raising you. And it, 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 it made me um, feel sad uh, when I thought about that. that but I also was uh, that, that child when I was growing up. I, al I always thought my father was this hero, blah, 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 blah. So it was the reason also why from it was imperative for me to uh, put Pax into a human level, to show his faults also, so that Ruru can see that, but, yeah, well, he's not a god. He's, he, has his own, he has his own issues. And then uh, I think the quote we were looking for is, is that when uh, Ruru's mom uh, says to, to Ruru, said, but, uh, the, the, the absent parent is, yeah. is, is always the hero. Yeah. the hero. You understand, he's always the hero, which is said, to the actual hero, mm -hmm. because the actual hero is the parent that stayed. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. I mean, th there is a, a, in a sense, I mean, I'm going to talk about my own reflection of this character of mm. Ruru and this episode where uh, she's longing for the absent parent mm. uh, to the neglect of the present parent. Mm. But there's something I found in the story, perhaps uh, uh, hidden under, which is it's it's the idea of the absent parent that sort of keeps her mm. inspired about the future yeah <laughs> does that yeah yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. So there is that also yeah right friction. yeah you know that's the inspiration yeah because, because once that, that friction is broken she too is broken yeah yeah you you are right there is that thing also and then even when she was an adult now and things were not going very well in her life in her professional life the first thing that comes into her mind, like, uh, because uh, there is this brokenness you feel when you grow up without another parent, mm -hmm. when there's a missing parent. I love what you put, you guys, in the quote you said, but all of us have this common uh, trauma, which is uh, uh, the trauma of absent yeah. fathers. Yeah. You said, I think, of Oprah, trauma. yeah, the generational trauma, uh, especially on, on black people, mm -hmm. is very common, I think. And uh, it's, 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 it's starting to show now that uh, we underestimate the impact of this thing. You understand? Because sometimes there's other issues when I think about our, our, our culture as South African. And then I think to myself, it is not enough that we, we, like, uh, we explain, for instance, the violence within our culture on poverty. It's like... It's not, because there are much more countries that are very much more poorer than us, but they are not as violent as us. You understand? And then, so this is what I'm trying to uh, investigate in the Wanderers. Where cometh this violence in our society? Yawana, is, is it because we haven't addressed the, 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 the horrible experiences we, we came through? You understand? There's, there is also a tendency of skipping over of what, hap of what happened in the 80s here. And some of us grew up in the 80s in the townships, you understand, and we live with that memory. And then there's this thing of a kind of a skipping over it, as if by, oh no, you were just there in the township, other people were in exile fighting for you. And I mean, Jesus, you understand, you know things that happened in the township. 
Do you know how we ended up being the worst enemies to ourselves? And then sometimes you were like killing ourselves more than the apartheid regime was killing us. Yeah, yeah and then there was a confusion, a sowing of confusion. That, uh, that, that is where the apartheid regime actually became very successful. And I was very surprised when I, 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 I learned from people who, who came from exile that but they themselves on the camps, there was a time like uh, the, ne the person living uh, like uh, sleeping next to you on the bed, you are not sure if he's an Askari or not. Yeah. They had solved the confusion among, among themselves. And then they, 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 most people don't know about this, that the ANC itself in exile has had these jails. And then there were people who were tortured by the ANC itself on these jails. And we, we never talk about that. We never talk about uh, the, 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 the people who died for nonsense in the streets of the township because if a, a person comes to you and proposes to you and they say, but no, I don't want you. And then because it's up on the complex, they say, but and then somebody just get banned for that nonsense. You understand? And we don't talk about these things. And I said to you, and uh, my, my, my mission as, as, a, as a historical novelist or, or as a creative uh, history is to identify these unhealthy silences and then say, but perhaps, guys, are we not missing something here? You understand? Because, yeah, there are hero stories. Like everybody now identifies with it because now if you, if you listen to people, Everybody was an activist in the township. And I'm like, hmm. <laughs> because there was a time when we were trying to organize political meetings. Only nine people would turn up. You understand? The people were just not prepared. We were scared. Because it was a matter of life and death. We were scared to get involved. But now if you, you hear people talking, everybody was in our township was an activist. And I'm like, hmm, whatever. <laughs> it's like a, you know, on white people, you don't find anybody who supported apartheid. It's the same thing, and and yet apartheid used to win by what close to seventy percent and all that stuff. But you can't find a, a single person who supported it now. So this is the the unhealthy silences that I don't like, and uh, perhaps they might be uh, at the heart of the the who we are as a society now, because we bury things under the carpet. We don't talk about things. You understand? Yeah, I mean, there is also love in, in the Broken River Tent. I don't want people to get the impression that <laughs> <laughs> one of us is about love and the other one is yeah. about war. <laughs> because the story of uh, uh, Pila and Nandi fascinates me as well. Because it's got two elements to it. I mean, firstly, it's this idea, you know, this is my, my ex, but, you know, we have unfinished business with the ex. And, <laughs> and, and whenever we meet, you know, <laughs> unfinished business sort of <laughs> lights off. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but at the same time, there's a, another professor, you know, in this relationship. Mm. So I, I, I wondered about that because I, I, I like that story. I sort of keep going back to it, you know, uh, mm. over and over <laughs> Because there is a, there is a, I suppose, familiarity. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can I, can I say something? <laughs> what fascinates me about that story is that 100% uh, of the time, women choose Nandi's side mm. and men chooses Pilar's side 100% of the time. <laughs> And I'm like, guys, is it, isn't there an in-between here? <laughs> I know somebody who's very strong about that. <laughs> and, then, and, I, and I'm like, but Nandi herself had her own issues. Why is only Pila who be getting blamed? Mm -hmm. uh, then, but, yeah, but then the, the Nandi's issues come uh, derived from Pila's issues. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, uh, to now, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was going there. <laughs> no, she feels very strong about that topic. Now, yet yeah, look, uh, I have I have seen men, perhaps like myself, who think they are decent men, and yet they don't understand the damage they do. You understand? Uh, and then that is what I was trying to portray there. You don't need to be a monster or a player to be damaging in that kind of a relationship. Uh, when sometimes, for instance, uh, when I look at Pila, perhaps I look at myself at my younger age, there's a sense of indecisiveness, which is very acute on Pila. The, the need to understand your identity, your history, 
and uh, yeah, there was also a time I kind of thought I might be going out of my mind. Yeah, and, I said, uh, and then my culture kind of helped me because that thing in us is interpreted as if we are Twasa or something. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, uh, what's going on here? Like, uh, why am I like this? <laughs> you understand? But then uh, I dumped all that rubbish on pill. <laughs> 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 I, yeah, anyway, I, I thought this would be my last question on this <laughs> theme about love and loss and, and longing. But there's something that interests me about, you know, the attachment to this sort of white skin mm. and, and how that, you know, yeah. it, although you, you know, <coughs> okay, all white people, you know, are evil because they colonize us. And <laughs> <laughs> put a white woman here and yeah. a man, you know, yeah. that evil goes away. Yeah. <laughs> That is, that is, that is, <laughs> that is, yeah, there is something, so, I, yeah. So hard, I mean, yeah, anyway, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, there is something I don't know about black men and the white skin, and uh, they think perhaps, especially I've seen it, once they feel successful, and the final uh, uh, hurdle mm -hmm. to go through is to have a white woman, and there is a sense of uh, domination or superiority. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not the first person, but I was just trying to portray that phenomenon. Yeah. It's, we all know that is there. Yeah. Is there? But also, I mean, uh, when I thought about it, uh, uh, when I was thinking about it, okay, that might be problematic. And I was like, okay, you would understand. For Pilar, who has spent a decade in Europe, and uh, probably all you could see majority would be white people. So at some stage, perhaps he, he had a, a white girlfriend. Mm -hmm. So to him, this falling into, for a white European woman has got a sub subconscious kind of thing. I don't like to judge things. I just try to portray yeah. so that yeah. other people can, can think yeah. for themselves, yeah. can think for themselves what is yeah. going on. So, so that is one thing you'll find on my, on my books when, it comes to the conclusions, and I, I leave it to up to the, to the reader to make up their own mind. Can I move then from the theme of love? To to another theme, and again, I'll follow the same style of trying to to draw the connections between the the, the books. So let's start with uh, Marco Oma um, uh, in uh, in the Broken River Tent. Um, who is uh, uh, Mika's son, um, but not king. In fact, he becomes regent. Mm. The king is uh, Golombane Sandil, mm. um, who subsequently becomes king in, in 1871. Uh, there, there is something about the, the, these Tosa divisions. I think that's something you try to explore. You know, there is the first Lamben Mika division. Then there is the Galega Khakabe division. What, what was the role of this sort of internal division in opening up the space for the colonists uh, to take over? I, mean, yeah. I want to talk also about Gaje, by the way. <laughs> and, and that quote you have there, I think it was uh, Lennox, um, what, what, one of his British colonels. Mm. Who was, and what fascinated me about that quote was whether Gaje, in fact, was in the war. Mm. You know? mm. uh, no. Because it sounded like she was, in fact, fighting in the war. Yeah. And that's something we've actually never, you know, uh, been exposed to. Anyway, yeah. Let's start about the, the theme of divisions. And I want you to connect that to the Mvengus, the division between the Kosa and the Mvengus. Yeah. Because in, in the Wanderers, we get that picture that actually the Mvengus are brought in as a buffer. Mm. 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 It's interesting because, uh, as, you, as, you, as you know, the first question I had was like, how can a 200 and plus people get off on the sea on a boat and defeat thousands of people all of a sudden? Mm. What was happening here? It does not make sense. Even if they, they came with guns, it does not make sense because there were thousands and thousands of us. You understand? But so why were they defeating us? And then I realized, uh, oh, even the frontier wars are not told properly. You understand? Because the uncomfortable truth is that we defeated ourselves. 
before they defeated us. The Amakosa, for instance, uh, started realizing that the land was going or was gone on the Ngale War. And then before then, the, the frontier wars were more amongst Amakosa themselves. With the white people, that is the Afrikaners and the British, opportunistically taking advantage of one side against the other. Let me paint a, a few pictures, for instance. Uh, when Khakhabe crossed the Inliba, which is, you know, as Kai, um, he comes uh, because he has had a, a fight with his brother, Utaleka. And then he realizes that, but although yeah, now Ukhakabe was the more powerful, but Utaleka by blood is the one who's an heir. So to give his brother a, 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 a chance and say, but okay, you are an heir. I will take my people, my followers, my cattle, and cross the Kai so that I'm not in your space. You understand? And that is how, uh, like, uh, by the way, as you know, you yourself, this is how Jeff Perez symbolistically tell that history. Which is a little bit wrong if we look at it because Amakos had been crossing the Kai as far back as the 16th century. But let's not get there. Let's just follow the, 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 the academic uh, accepted history now. <laughs> so when he gets here, Ukhakabe, he is still telling that, but I need to challenge my brother. Mm -hmm. Even though when he crosses the, the, the Buffalo River in Yat, he, 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 he slaughters the buffalo and gives the, the, right, the right arm and send it back to his brother as a sign, yeah, as a sign that but I am under you, you are my chief, you understand? But basically, he was, he, what he was doing was buying time. So across the, 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 the Kai, where now we, we the, the area we know as the Siskai, and this is where the, the, the white settlers came to. This is why Amakakabe were the ones who were dealing with the white people uh, before than anybody. He collects all the small tribes of Amakosa that had uh, crossed on the on the 17th, 18th century. So this is yeah, man. You deal with yeah. This. It's for those who are, are interested in this, uh, page 45. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When Imbogoto was broken, the sons of Palo fought from their mother's womb. We saw bulls on the same by go, go each other, opening wide the gates for the enemies to flood in. Mm. Yeah. When he got older, Khakhab crossed tributaries like Izele River near the drift, where he killed Inyat. To show he harbored no ill intent to his brother, he sent its breast and leg to the great place as a tribute. His brother, Talega, accepted the gesture, although they had recently been in conflict. The gesture meant Khakhab was subjecting himself to the paramountcy of Talega. Thereafter, Khakhab called that river Inyati River. Yeah, that's a very which is what the, the Buffalo River, the, the, that whole city, the, the, the metropolis is, is named after that now, the Buffalo Metropole. You understand? Yeah, thanks for that, Tamaga. So, Okakabe, what it does now, he collects all those small tribes, Zamakosa uh, and Khoi Khoi people, and then he forcefully subject them, actually, under his rule. The stronger ones resisted him, and there were these wars. So, like for instance, Amakunukwebe, which is a very interesting thing, Otungwa, he's the first person to uh, settle in, Dwar in Dwar the so called the Zufert, where the Grahamstown and all Port Al Afred uh, fall under now. So, Ukhakabe, his main objective was to subdue Otungwa. Yeah, well, and Otungwa was strong, stronger even than Khakhab. So, what does Ukhakabe do? He befriends the, 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 the Boer farmers who were uh, uh, running from Cape Town from the British. They didn't want to, be, to fall under the British, the so-called Fortrekkers, whatever. He, f he befriends them. And then he uses them to defeat Tukung. They, fought, they fight and, uh, uh, on, on, the, on, 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 on the side of Kaka. That thing uh, happened. Unlambe, when he was defeated by his, by his uh, nephew, Unlega, uh, most people think uh, uh, Unlambe and Unlega fought only once. They actually fought three wars. Yes. And, uh, and Unlega defeated him twice. The third time is the, the war we know as the War of Tutula, of Tutula, which was basically the Kosa Civil War. And immediately after you that tell war... Tell us a little bit about that, because yeah. <laughs> later on we know that Makoma 
um, when he talks about Gaja. Mm. Uh, he's so fascinated watching her wash uh, in this river and looking at her legs. <laughs> and he says, now I know what uh, <laughs> impact no. Tutula had. Yeah. <laughs> which is why there was on a break. Tutula like. had on Riga, which is why there was a whole war yeah. over this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. The cult. <laughs> Ah well, uh, let's not talk about that now. We'll go, let's let's tackle history first. <laughs> let's tackle history first. Yeah, and then uh, and then yeah, that thing of of Tutula. And another thing that it answers uh, another thing you asked me. This fascination about light skinned people among, in, with Kosa men, mm. because with Kosa men, uh, this thing goes back to aristocrats. If you are an aristocrat or you have a lot of cattle. Or you are a, you are a chief, you are a chief, you are a chief. Then you'll you'll marry a sun woman that has a, a white skin. Mm -hmm. So there was always this fascination with white skin with uh, aristocrats and and chiefs. So it's not a new thing. This this thing of uh, whatever. What do you call it? Yellow but the yellow bone. <laughs> this yellow bone thing is not it's not a new thing. You yeah, understand that? Mm -hmm. So um, the war of Tutula, of course, if you are coming from the background of uh, Western. Uh, culture and, and uh, Western history, you would know that kind of war as a Helen of Troy. It's the same thing. Uh, the, the nations fighting over one woman. So Amakosa uh, Undrambe had taken uh, his, his nephew's uh, girlfriend and then his nephew got fed up with that and, and decided. But after all, Undrambe was acting as a regency then of Amakaka. And then Ungliga thinks, after all, I think I'm old enough now. I want to go to the mountain and after that I want my regions. I want to be a, a king. And then that's how these uh, internal wars between Amakakabe started. So by the time uh, the war of Tutula was finished, uh, Amakakabe had almost emaciated themselves. And then the unfortunate thing is that, <coughs> which is why sometimes it's difficult to ignore the the higher purposes or whatever you call it because that's almost exactly the time that uh, the white settlers come and they find them across at their weakest they have just recovered from a very major civil war you understand so it's easy to come in between them divide and rule so the british come on 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 uh, on, on the side of Ngaga uh, because Ngaga asked for help from the British. Ndlambe was always being helped by the Afrikaners. So that divide and rule. So basically, uh, this is why I'm saying by even these frontier wars, when we talk about them, we talk about them in a simple stick way, as if it was just a white versus black. Yeah. It was not that simple. It was not that simple. The only war that we can talk about is that uh, in a, even like basically Lamakosa initiated was the was the Ngale war when they attacked uh, the Gramstown. Then Amakosa were, were, were seeing because they were losing the land. And then there was like a uh, like, but the land is gone. We're busy why, fighting why with this. Amakoma blame Ngale for that war? <sighs> this is complicated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it needs, uh, for those who, who, who didn't rule, uh, the, who didn't read the, the Broken River Tent, uh, after reading about this, even the historians themselves are, com are, confli are com uh, conflicted on this. When Amangaga were the only people, were the one of the few Kosa nations who didn't participate on the Ngale War, why? They had just fought Nondlam, the Guwoga Tutul, and lost. That's why Umar Goma nearly died, actually. He, it was his first uh, battle to lead. He had just come from the mountains. He was a young chief. He was motivated, whatever. And even Nondlam, Nondlam was using his own son. So that's why it was called also a, a war of princes. Because Umar Goma was, was fighting Umtushan. But Nondlam had been clever enough by saying in Doba, Onega, which is Makoma's father, is selling the land to the white people. 
So Untlambe went across the Kai in Niba to Amakalega. Remember we talked about but Amakalega, uh, although Amakagabe now were a separate nation, but their parliaments, they still recognize the parliaments of Amakalega, even today. Yeah. Uh, parliaments of Amakosa is quite like across the Kai. So Ndlambe sent people there and said, bah, go and tell um, uh, Ulandoza, oh, oh, inside himself was still a young boy there. You yeah, understand that? And uh, oh, oh, had 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 issues like, where during in one of their wars, Nondlam, where the, the second war, like for instance, Nondlam was fighting Noins, and then Nondlam uh, uh, defeated them both. Yeah, no, in, in fact, Oinza at some stage was also kept a prisoner by Unlik with Unlamb. But then Unlik decided, Ndoba, I cannot keep my king a, a prisoner because he's, he's a king. So he sent him back and he said, Ndoba, don't come here and mingle across the, the Kai again. You understand? Stay on that side if you want us to respect your paramounts. You understand? But then this is what the second time Oinza came in assistant Gandlamb on the, on the Tutula War. And this time they defeated Umlek. And this is the time the war actually that even shook Amakosa. Ama because Amakosa, when they fought, it was over dominance. You don't kill people. When, when, uh, at most, four or five people will be killed. The only thing you do, you take cattle so that you, you kill Ilanos, the self sustenance of the, of the other. But you don't kill people. It was the first time that shocked Amakosa. Because they, they, they like, I make my comma say this, but this, is, this, this was not a battle. They, this was emancipation. They wanted to destroy us. And that's, that was Nala's doing. Nala said in Doba, as long as Umlega is a corner, we will always be divided. Let's just destroy him. You understand? And Umlega was gaining power because Umlega was a witch doctor. And then during the, the, the war of uh, Tutula, he was the one who gave them these medicines, but they will defeat Amangal because that was the first time Untlam defeats Ungal. And then that, 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 that win was associated with the powers Ganglai. Even Untlam, his power was decreasing now. People were looking to Ungal. And then they, that's the time like a, a, a common people were, were losing trust on their ships. And then they wanted miracles because the, the white people were taking the land and they were taking the cattle. So this is how Unlan actually, had he succeeded on that on that war, yeah. he would have been a, a Landosa, a, a leader, a, a Yamandlam. Where, where do you stand on the debate? Could he have succeeded? Uh, I, I argued that if the Corsas could have won any war, it was the Nile War. Exactly. Now, if if like let's put it this way, even I know uh, like how you you, you 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 put it, even yourself on your book. Mm -hmm. Had Amakosa won that war, all this colonial thing would have been different. You understand? Because they would have killed the seed of colonization at its seed. You understand? And the British had no appetite to colonize the Cape because it was costly to them. They didn't see anything until the, the discovery of diamonds. They were five to, to let him go, a Cape colony, because it was not a priority to them. And you know the British Empire was fighting wars everywhere. You understand? So they couldn't, uh, they were like, if you read the British parliamentary like uh, journals and all those things, you see that by almost, there were five to, 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 to getting rid of Cape Colon by, hey, just leave that thing alone. And the only thing we said to you is that by protect the, 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 Kamban, the Cape Town as a road to India. We don't care about this colonizing the natives. Leave the natives alone. You understand? But then uh, the diamonds were founded and then everything changed. <laughs> and then, but the point you are right when you say, but had Amakosa won the Ngale War, things would have been totally different, especially in the Cape Colony. Yeah. Would but have been totally different. Also, won the war. It was a, yeah. a tactical mistake. It was Ngale's tactical mistake because, first of all, Ngale had never led any war. Yeah. Ngale was just a yeah, and he did not know any any tactics. Like, for instance, people like Omar Koma were generals. It was a common thing. Like, this is the, the thing uh, sometimes uh, that makes uh, me to be divided among other people. The Ngala was, was, the Ngala war was not a Ngala war. Every person knew that Ilandoza Kremstown has to be 
attacked and destroyed. Yeah. And everybody was blaming that, including Michael. Mm -hmm. And Michael, Mark, because he had led wars, he knew wars, and he said, but you cannot attack an elephant with a stick. Mm -hmm. So he was using the Africaners, getting more guns, and said, but give me about six months mm -hmm. until I get enough guns, and then we, we, we destroy this thing once and for all. But Ungale could not risk that because he needed that, that battle to be his win. Mm -hmm. So he went there prematurely. And then when things started going wrong, because first of all, they had agreed, but it's just a small, it was just a small village. It was not even a town. It was just a small village. Attack it at night, destroy it, burn it down, mm -hmm. and we're done. It was a going to be a simple thing. Yeah. And then Ungale makes a mistake of wanting to see in Dubai, what are the people doing in that village? Yeah, yeah and then, then it takes about 200 people. Come, let's go and see. Yeah. Let's go and see Bapuma Etlatin. Let's go and see Baben Zandon. And then the British see them. And then they believe in Dubai. Hey, I'm a cause are going to attack us. And then instead of just uh, flying, Ungale said, Bye, hey, hi. Mshlam, Uzat Babon, Aland, Babon, that's Baleki, Lebai, Egeland. Then not follow us. He starts attacking. In day, broad daylight. And then. This is the lesson Makoma had already learned yeah. Gogo when the British were defeating Amandla. Mm -hmm. Oba, it is nonsensical and stupid to attack these people on an open field. Mm -hmm. You understand? This is why he established the guerrilla wars. Mm -hmm. You want to attack on the, on the forest but and hide. Remind me on the and side, hide. Is mm -hmm. that where the British introduced Infagatol? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. That is where the, the first, uh, first cannon they, they used a, 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 a cannon first here in this, in this yeah. land. And that is also one of the things that 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 that, that shook come across yeah. that sound of a cannon it was the first time they hear that sound of a cannon and they were like yo these witches they are <laughs> coming with, 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 with the sky now they are taking us with the sky yeah one and i mean because i mean honestly it's like there's like a, about what ten thousand people are taking 700 people mm. and then i'm like how stupid can this get i'm not saying why would you not win this that war I don't care what they were carrying. We are not, why would you not win that war? And then when you realize that uh, Amakos, actually the majority of them who died, died uh, uh, retreating from there. And then they ended up killing each other also. Those who, were, who, had, uh, who had guns were shooting uh, 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 there. And then the guns didn't have the range, a proper range. And then they ended up shooting another Abanya Amakos. And then... The other thing is, again, this divide and rule thing. This is why I'm very passionate about this neglect of uh, the so-called Gonukwem. Because had uh, the Gonukas not come to the rescue of the white people on that, on that attack, Amakosa would have still seen the day. Because immediately the, the, these guys, or Henry, came, and then they know how Makosa uh, think. They were like, just uh, just shoot the, their chiefs. Once they see their chiefs falling, Bazalkumba is the thing of the ancestors. It's not I, I Salunga, Magbalek. <laughs> and as a result, most of, yeah, <laughs> most of them died on the retreat rather than on the attack. Yes. And uh, it was so unfortunate. Uh, I think uh, the. The reasonable number, uh, average, nobody knows how many died. But perhaps the average is not more than 2,000, but not less than 1.5 yeah. on a one afternoon. Yeah, yeah one of that was like the first of, of like so much people die. There is a, a, a river there uh, they call Ikoi. And of course, white people couldn't pronounce that. They, today, you, you, hear, you know it as Koi, Koi River. Koi. Yeah, Koi River. So the, tribul the tribulet of uh, Koi passes through Grahamstown. And they say it, it, it became red with blood. And as a result, according to Amakosa, it's known as a Gazini River. Mm. And then the Blood River. Yeah. I also wanted to talk about religion. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> And I want to quote uh, between pages 90 and 91. Here, this is what it says. Perhaps you are right. It's Christianity without God. We killed God in our hearts because we could no longer stand his demands. We want to make our own laws live according to our desires. 
without God poking an eye in everything we do. We could no longer stomach all that Victorian rubbish they tortured you by. And why tolerate that? Actually, the idea of God in our hearts is theirs also. If you care to know, it is black people now who are more religious, reminding everyone about God, <coughs> to an extent that some of our black priests travel over oceans to re-evangelize the countries of white people there. <laughs> and they, and they managed to steal any of the white people's land while giving that religion. White people are too clever for that. They cannot fall th for that trick they duped us with. I'll be damned. I thought white people said there was no meaning in life without God. Perhaps there isn't, but we are too busy entertaining ourselves to bother with those things now. So religion was s central to this. Uh, and what I, I hadn't realized before, before reading the Broken River Tent was the impact of uh, Funding Camp and James Reed. And that actually both um, Nsikana and Nguel had the influences mm. uh, because the sort of academic history posits Nsikana and Nguel on polar opposites. Mm. But actually they are not uh, because they both had these uh, um, Christian influences. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the, the interesting thing for me is that during our era now, Nsikane is known as this one, the Christian uh, who are trying to convert people. But in actual fact, Ongale was more Christian than Nsikane. Yeah. And because Ongale had grown up on the, with the missionaries. And then, of course, Ongale, because he was a thinker in a way, he was like, you keep telling me that but I'm a brother of this Christ, and that you know, now you are telling me now I'm a kafir when you are white. Yeah, and where is this brotherly thing uh, featuring? Yeah, when I say he got fed up with it. The, 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 the truth of the matter is that both of them, both uh, Nala's religion and both uh, uh, your Nsigana's religion, had confused understanding of the Christian religion that they, the two of them, uh, listened to Fanda Kemke. Fanda Kemke was the first missionaries to Amakos. So when they, they Ungale used to uh, go and listen to him in, uh, in the first missionary in South Africa, which is better so. So Ungale uh, was, uh, was, was born under the Vuba nation, what uh, the Vuba mountains, perhaps in the area now we call Yudenhek. You understand that? So he was influenced he will, uh, because better so was close there. He will listen to this. This thing, Tina, as a Makosa, we think it's ours. It's a religion of our ancestors that uh, the, the ancestors will rise. That's from the camp influence on Nguyen and the resurrection. And I'm going to reinterpret this resurrection and put it into the ancestors. And uh, this thing where, it, uh, where we harvest the horror of it is on Nguyen because it stays with Amakosa within the DNA Amakosa for those close to 50 years and then we harvest because Umlalo was the first to preach this thing and then Umlanje and he came with a similar thing and then we harvest its horror but kill your cattle and then the ancestors will rise blah 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 but uh, the the notion which uh, fascinates me because our history is told from the point of view of white people. There is not a single uh, uh, stance whereby people look for the influences of Van der Kemp on Nguyen and Zigan and how those influences uh, became what I say, like we ended up harvesting that quarter. Because you must remember, Van der Kemp himself was this Dutch guy who went to Scotland to start and all that stuff. He was what today we'll call a fundamentalist. You understand? He thought he was living on the last days. And Unale believed that when he listened to it. But we were living on the last days. And he called Orlando, like the, the, and the ancestors will rise and all that stuff. But Unale believed that. You understand? Where I would, uh, I would, uh, lastly, I would uh, concede in Doba. 
Ongale used his knowledge because Ongale, if we were saying e Konekwas were children that were born between a Kosa <coughs> woman and a, a son woman, so Ongale will be a Konekwa himself because his mother was a son. And this is the reason why Ongale, by the way, this thing you call him Makanda, you understand that? It's like calling him doctor because Ongale was a herbalist, so a Kanda Mayes. So go strong mark hand if you go there, go here you can my yes. You understand? So everybody was a kind of a herbalist, that kind of thing will be called a Makan. But he was a chief Makan again because of his influence. So Unmala got that influence from his mom, because his mom was a son people and they knew how to use medicine to heal people. So he got that influence. Mix it with the with the Christian religion. Mix it with ability to speak Dutch, Kosa and uh, what's this other language? So Umnale also was multilingual and English was multilingual because he grew on the missionaries. You see how powerful Umnale was basically. You understand with all this knowledge. That is why he could sway the whole nations and even be powerful than the kings, Samakos. Because he had all these answers people were looking for. And Umnale made himself into uh, John the Baptist. He used to stay in the desert and eat locusts and, 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 and fast. You understand? Honestly, I'm not joking. And, and yeah, <laughs> and, <speak. laughs> and these are the things he learned from Ufanda Kem. This is what Ufanda Kem was doing. He would go to the desert and eat locusts because Ufanda Kem believed himself that he was living on the last time, and he believed himself that he was an apostle to the Kefas. Of course, he was an, an apostle to the Kefas because he, for instance, the the ship that was bringing him to the Cape Colony, uh, the first one. Ended up in South America, yeah. and then he was like, ah! and, <laughs> and then quite, uh, the, the the missionary said, but just stay there, and then and just and just uh, proselytize and convert those, and then he said, no, 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 I'm the apostles of the couples. I need to go to the Cape Colony. Mm -hmm. So, I, uh, 15 years, uh, 15 years after that, he was back in in uh, in, in in Netherlands, and then he got into another ship. Nalena's ship was going to Australia. So when he got there, he was on that ship that was taking prisoners, European prisoners, to Australia. He was preaching those, those prisoners there. <laughs> he was preaching those prisoners there. And then when he got there, he stayed in Australia for three years. He became the missionary. And Bam Tanga, they were begging him, but stay here, be our priest, be, because he was also a, a medical doctor. So he was also a, like, a, he was a trained medical doctor. I mean, scientific. So they were begging him. The, the Australia itself was, was still a, a, a new colony. And then he was like, no, the thing God has put to me in my heart, in my heart is that my, I am going to be the apostles of the Kafirs. So I need to go to the Cape Colony. <laughs> so eventually he got here in 1799. Talking about uh, <laughs> eat, eating locusts, I mean, I think in the scale of uh, sort of closer oddities, probably Mlangeni also yeah, yeah, no ranks, ranks, ranks no, among no, them. No, no, no. Because he used to yeah. eat Amaka and Mbovan. Yeah. 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 And spend eight hours a day on the river. Yeah. He was pale and blanched and... Uh, and uh, but um, and I, he had some scientific knowledges. I mean, if you look at the medicine he was giving people, uh, to as, and then he was saying about this, they will give them courage and strength and all that stuff. I've uh, were busy investigating that. It's basically what uh, Viagra is made of. <laughs> 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 so yeah, it increases the the the, the, the testosterone, and then that's why people thought that they'll become brave, and then they will attack. So there is a scientific thing in this thing that was overlooked. <laughs> that was yeah, overlooked. That the <laughs> yeah, yeah, and all those things. I read those were superstitions. Yeah. And then, like, um, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's 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 those are other things. Now, but anyway, I, I <laughs> move. Uh, but I think we have no time because I'm on the time I allocated for us. We have yeah. five minutes uh, beyond that time. Um, but I wanted to move perhaps to the history side of the wanderers um, i know we've been dealing with the history side of, of the broken of river ten sorry guys we ended up talking too much <laughs> about yeah, the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the the part at which the infengu story features prominently is the murder or the killing of um, Golomba and Sandil. Mm. And this is 1878 mm. in the last Kosa war mm. a so-called uh, uh, mm. mm. uh, mm. war. 
Oh. And up until then, I mean, the, the Mvengos always thought that they were the chosen ones. Oh. Um, in fact, your, the title, as I understand, the Wanderers, the Mvengos are the Wanderers. Mm. Yeah. Oh. Can you just talk about that? Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, thanks for reminding me about that. Because uh, it links with the fact that the thing I was talking about that uh, without a mom thing also and uh, that uh, divide and rule the British there was no way they could have conquered Amakloth mm -hmm. and the, the interesting thing is Amam Vengo and the white settlers arrived in the Cape Colony almost at the same time mm -hmm. it's quite spooky when you think about these things it was like four three years Amam Vengo were fleeing from the now so-called KZN they were fleeing uh, the, the Shaga Wars but that also is a little bit simplistic because Amam Fengu also, Amatlubi were made into a, a nation today we call Amam Fengu. And uh, Amatlubi had fled UKZN even why, when uh, Shaga was, hadn't come to the picture. You understand that? In actual fact, uh, Ushaga, when he take over the House of Umteta, is because of the House of Umteta having defeated Amatlubi. And then Amatlubi started pouring into the Eastern Cape then. But then they were not called Amamfengu. This thing Amamfengu came when they, when they were fleeing from the Chaga Wars. You understand? So yes, these people, when they get into the Eastern Cape, they are emancipated, they have no kings, they have no cattle, they are hungry, they are begging food, everything from Amakos. And then Amakos is just like, okay. Because I'm of course I've got this understanding that Omahambi is very important. Mm -hmm. And then this is the reason so also. You quote it in yeah. very broken over 10. This yeah. is Omahambi. This is Omahambi. Mm -hmm. But it's like they always respect a, a visitor. And then I think also this is the reason even the white uh, settlers were able to take advantage of them. Because a Kosa man will get off his own bed to uh, accommodate a visitor. You understand that? And, and, and all that stuff. So, um, when they got there, Amakosage uh, hired them basically as uh, their shepherds. So, Amamvengu were shepherding Kosa cattle and all that stuff. I know other people uh, dispute this, but there are quotes whereby Amakosa and Yanke, uh, the Ohins, I used to call them, when uh, the British were taking uh, the Mfengus and Seba, they are crossing uh, with Amam Fengu and And then Insa was like, you are, these people have been under my protection. You understand? And they, I have given them land, food in my own country. And now they are part of my people. So you cannot just take them like that. And, but uh, that's another history. But at some stages, there was this understanding that Amam Fengu were the underdogs because they, they owned nothing. They were nothing. So it was easy for Amam Fengu when the British were fighting Amakosa to go and assist the British because after defeating Amakosa, there's the booty, the cattle, which Utembega talks about in the, in the land matters. In the we always talk about land. We forget about the generational wealth. Yeah. We, are con we are connecting those things uh, uh, and these wars, how many cattle they took from, from the Marcos. It's already like a, close to a million. Yeah. You understand? And a million cattle for that time, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot. This is the, the reason why Amakos are, because in their way of, of living, they heavily dependent on cattle. Without cattle, they cannot self-sustain. And the British came to know that, to understand that. But if you want these people to be our indentured slaves, basically, just take the cattle, and then they will be forced to come and look for work. Mm. Yeah, and, and then, yeah. Ronald Devon said that yeah. uh, if you despoil clearly of cattle, yeah. then he will come begging. Yeah. So it was a Sahil. By the, or yeah. I mean, yeah, that's the son. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Inza's son. So um, this, the concept of the wanderers, uh, in that in that sense, the Amam Fengu played a crucial role in the defeat of uh, the Kosa nation, and those tensions uh, during those time were live. 
I joke about it in, in the Wanderers as if it's a joke, but then it was not a joke. You understand? But again, you mentioned an incident, Jen, I tell you, for instance. God's history is never simple. The people in the end, during the Ngai Tribi War, when basically Amakosa was a, a spent force, there was a, a, a front guard against Tusandil. Of, uh, the interesting part is that, like for instance, I'll give you an example. When Usandile was... So at was this point, so just, uh, Makoma was taken to prison in 1869. Yeah. Yes. No, by, the, by then Makoma had already even died. Was, yeah. was, oh, oh, was and, then the, and then Sandile took over like yeah. a year later. Yeah. And then within 10 years thereafter, he himself was killed. Yeah. And then he was killed on this bush. And then the, so the British were using the, the Mfengo regime yeah. because they couldn't uh, flush Usandile out of the, the, the forest. You understand? So they were using the Mfengus. But then, the, the interesting thing... <laughs> <laughs> the, in, the interesting thing now, which is why I'm saying I just want to point out, my history is never, is never uh, that simple. The people who had formed the, the, the guard for Sandil, and they had rifles. Mm -hmm. And the British themselves were very scared because most of them were coming from the Cut River, and they had been uh, they had been armed for quite some time now. They knew how to use guns, and they were great marksmen. And one of them was Udukwan, who was uh, Ntsikana's son. And he had been treated as if, because Ntsikana was, was a convert to Christianity, and not Dukwana followed that. And then they were the first people to actually uh, take a, a Western civilization seriously. Among Amakos. So Dukwana was learning Christianity. He was known as a, as a reverend because he was a pastor. And then, but then when they started to see what the British, because itself was genocidal. Yeah. And then the, the converts now, even themselves, the one who knew how to shoot at rifles, were like, this is nonsense. Because this, they are not trying to defeat Amakos, they are trying to wipe them out. Yeah. You understand? And then now, that guard that was guarding Mgolomban was 60% made up of a mom thing. You understand? The first convent. So history is never that simple. So mommy, you must be careful when you are listening to people uh, in London. So the basically, by that, by that stage, what I'm trying to say to you is that but Amam Feng were actually fighting each other. Yeah. They were fighting each other on the side of Yamakosa and then on the side of the British. We're fighting each other now. You understand? Because they had been so... History is very complicated. I don't know how to, to put yeah. this. That's all I can say, but it's never that simplistic. Uh, no, thank you. It's <laughs> the right point to pause because this is the last frontier war. Yeah, uh, that's the that's last the, frontier. The final defeat and submission yeah. uh, of the war. So we are still living with those scars and consequences. Anyway, uh, yeah. thank you for, for writing these books. Uh, <laughs> what are we going to do with all of this history? That well, well, we will ask the people on the ground. <laughs> yeah, thank you uh, for producing these books. They're both wonderful. I strongly recommend them. I've I had to read this one before it became a book, so that I could give a quote. <laughs> and uh, this the first one. I I had seen a review about it, uh, but it then didn't get published. And the, the time went on and on and on for like months and months. And I was busy trying to publish uh, The Land is Ours then. And when it was finally published, I, I realized that my book started, because my book starts with Mlanje. It starts where his book ends. So. Wow. It was an interesting <laughs> coincidence. <laughs> That's the first thing we talked about when we first met and said, but I've just finished your book, and it's, it's quite interesting uh, because you actually uh, start where I ended. Yeah. <laughs> Immediately where I ended. And then it starts there. And by the way, uh, you remember, you know why it took so long for the Broken River Ten to be published? Even it was already already announced that it was coming. Is that Bonang Tibeto on the <laughs> on the black books? My book was 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 following that book, and then when that thing came, we had to re 
<laughs> thing yeah. and the, let's go back and read it <laughs> and read it this manuscript because we take it out before we take it out <laughs> let's read this manuscript again <laughs> and which is, was good which was good <laughs> said the publisher with Bonan. Uh, and my book was following Bonan's book. <laughs> yeah. And then, I mean, we had done everything uh, in our power, but then now we knew that we we're going to be under the spotlight. Yeah. Yeah. So we needed to double check. And that, at the end, it, it helped my book, yeah. in a way, because now we had more editors looking at it, because it's a little bit of a complex, of a, uh, a complex book. And even myself, and uh, I was very happy about it, because... I, I could find some mistakes that I had missed uh, before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, well done. Uh, this is a great achievement. Um, we, we still have another 25 minutes uh, for those who they don't have to be about the book. They could be about life, love, <laughs> history. Yeah. Politics, Pugs, Nandi. No, we have a picture him. She is. He was a whore when he was not in, com in a committed relationship. He was a that's why we brought him here <laughs> so that he can be part of the conversation <laughs> um any comments on that to your home <laughs> 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 And, and sing that also, also sing that. He said, he said, uh, Pax is, you know, mostly based on, you know, some of, of you. There's more of you. Don't miscode me. Don't miscode me. So I, you know, I, 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 I actually saw one of your interviews uh, online, and then <laughs> some white guy was asking you about, um, uh, about Pila trying to find out his history and background and then he says does that reflect you i'm like what on earth <laughs> <laughs> i mean people are just clueless yeah and that sometimes uh, this silly question look the the truth of the matter but i refuse to be misquoted yeah. <laughs> i said i said i remember yeah i said uh, some of experiences that parks had yeah. especially in the township are my experiences. Yeah. So the <laughs> town Yeah, well, like Kaloku, the, the lawyers would say, but you said ANC, the, <laughs> and then now we know that it's ANC, but now they'll say, but this looks like ANC, it works like ANC, that quacks like an ANC, <laughs> that it quack like an ANC, yeah. nobody knows, so we can talk about that in, in the court of law. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then a reader will know who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing without spelling things out. Yeah, another thing I actually was quite surprised about when I was uh, talking to, to people who returned from MK, almost all of them, the first thing they will tell you how bored they were. Yeah. I was like, it's all so boring just sitting there and uh, doing the trainings and after that, there's, and there's nothing. They're like, we need to go to a battle. They, they, like, at some time, they even like kind of rebelled. I said, but we cannot be sitting on the camps all the time. And then, yeah, they, I, of course, they, some of them, 
that I know, and they gave me these uh, anecdotes, which I put as Pax's experience that when we were in Swaziland, and then, like, uh, we, of course, uh, people were looking at us, and then we had no women around us, so we had to make do. <laughs> what we thought, uh, and then, and then, and also, I needed to plant a seed to my reader that perhaps were how Pax got his AIDS, uh, the, the virus, is because of his carelessness on the sexual behavior. And then, I, you must remember also, um, I grew up at the time where we did not know about these condom things. We did not, and then when I look back. Uh, on my growing up experience, I was like, oh, I must have been graced that we didn't <laughs> get this, this, this AIDS thing. <laughs> you know, how did we miss this? You understand? Because, I mean, there was a tendency of uh, carelessness on sexual matters when we grew up. Because we hadn't gone, we hadn't undergone the, the shock of the pandemic, the yeah. pandan, pandemic, yeah. which was AIDS. Yeah. And then that's another thing uh, uh, I wanted to talk about. Because they, our generation, we lost a lot of people to AIDS, and we have never talked about that. We just wash over it, and then as if we, we, we make believe that it never happened. So it was quite a, an interesting coincidence that I ended up finishing the book under another pandemic. You understand? So now the, 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 the people could associate about the, the cloud and the horror I'm, I'm talking about. On, the, on, on, on Parks, because Parks also, when I, I, I envisioned him, I wanted a man that is not going to hide behind religion, behind philosophy, behind all these things that we try to delude ourselves on. I wanted a man that will stand naked before his own mortality and then and see what remains. And then, because uh, I, had, I had seen it to people who were next to me how when they were dying of AIDS how uh, the thing about death is that it strips you to the fundamentals to the fundamentals all the illusions go away you understand when you are facing with your own mortality with your own death and you your death and you know it's immediate and you know it's not going anywhere and I, I knew that uh, perhaps my reader will be tempted to thinking, ah, oh, perhaps Pax will survive, and I'm like, he's not going to survive. <laughs> <laughs> he's not going to survive. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Like, I, I knew that like, at some stage, uh, even if those who don't like him, they think it's a war, but at some stage, I wanted a, a full man, not, not an idealized man. I wanted a man with his own faults. Yeah. And then looking into his life, the mistakes he made himself, and then trying to reckon with them without using these uh, cheap uh, things of hiding behind religion and all those things. I have nothing against religion. The only thing I, I don't like is when religion is used for purposes of power to control other people. You know, these things I don't like about these pastors. And then it's, a, it's the same thing. I have nothing against Christianity. My problem is Christendom. That is the use of the gospel message for imperialistic purposes and uh, to dominate other, other people you know, into your own thing, which is what colonialism did. Because colonialism would have not been able to take root without the Christian. The Christian, and then, like uh, I think Mark Goma says, the Christian missionaries are the, the sharp end of the colonial stick. You might say, once you see them, that wound they first you, you get from them, you know that the colonial government is coming behind them. You know, so. yeah. I mean, I suppose on this theme of, uh, you say it's death, I mean, it sounded to me when I, I was reading the one that was, that it's more disease, it's sickness. Mm. You know, it's, it's sickness that brings about the, the, the sense of uh, defeat mm. in a man. Mm. Where you look back and you ask, well, was this worth it? Mm. Was my life actually meaningful? Yeah. Yeah, and also, like, uh, there, is, there is no running away from this because why, where we are now. And we had uh, a lot of hopes in 1994, which is where, basically, actually, even the Rwandan experience features. I had shamefully missed what was happening in Rwanda in 1994. 
because Tina, we were happy getting freedom and all, and most of us missed what was going there. And the country was, was under the genocide, they were killing each other. And then I feel ashamed when I think about that. But how did we miss this? But of course, we're preoccupied with our own things. So now I wanted to measure and see that, but in 1994, I, I, Rwanda was at its worst, undergoing its worst experiences with the genocide. And in 1994, we're at our own hopeful. And we thought that a new uh, phase of freedom is coming. And then now, when you look at us now, it seems that the, the fund of our hope has been uh, depreciated. And uh, we, we feel let down. And then this is the reason why I say perhaps it was good that this, the, the Wanderers was not published first. Because now it resonates what Pax goes under resonates more to people when they see what we're, going, we're undergoing now. Yeah, now. Because perhaps then they would have think perhaps he was just a, a bitter MK soldier. Because he tries to say, to, to make this thing happen because at the core of it, he's like, I am not going to be part of uh, deluding our own people. I am not going to be part of a freedom that is unjust. And then like a that freedom without economic justice. And then people are in a hurry too much to assume power. They do not understand the consequences of this. And now we see all those things now, unfortunately. But, w but where, so, uh, hand, but where, where do you stand on the, I mean, in, 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 in the Wanderers, you contrast the TRC, I think, with something called Gachacha, mm -hmm. yeah. which was the yeah. Rwandan version. Yeah. Yeah. But was the TRC a waste? Actually, I don't think so. I think that the TRC was necessary, but as usual with South African things, we botched it on implementation. And uh, the and the, the thing of uh, how also we botched it is the is, is the, I think South African politicians, including Ombeg and Mandela, had too much trust because. Uh, the TRC basically were based on the notion that uh, people who did all these things will come forward and then they will confess and then people who lost their children and their loved ones will have a closure. Hardly ever that thing happened. You understand? So I think uh, more than anything, the TRC benefited you guys as lawyers. You found, of course, a language of speaking of what we, undergo we underwent to. And uh, it, it was necessary in a sense that uh, as black people ourselves, we have a language to say now we were betrayed because it's part of that. But you guys did this to our people. We trusted you that you will come forward <coughs> and you didn't. You said you will come forward. Hardly any ones of them. Only those who were already known. Yeah, and there were al already uh, cases against them that came forward. The rest sat down, took their pensions, and either went to Australia and, 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 the, and, and, and or sat here, took that money pension, reinvested it, because now we were on a free country and became more rich from, from all those things. So that is my disappointment uh, uh, on the TRC process. I think it was, it was uh, necessary, but we were not able to implement it uh, well. How? Could we have done it? I have no idea. That's for you guys, lawyers and all that stuff. So I'm just saying now what I experienced was I, I was, was left uh, uh, wondering, wondering. And then I even, the, the reason why I, I, I contrasted with the Kachasha, because initially I had this notion before I studied the, 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 the Rwandan cases, I thought the Rwandan were doing it properly because they were doing it village by village, community by community, and then people, the village people knew each other. And this is the sad thing about the, the, the Rwandan thing, by the way, is that but it's not strangers who came to kill people. It's people who were neighbors, who knew each other, and then they killed each other. It's so like that thing, but, oh, we know that, but is Mfengu, so we're killing Amam Fengu. Yeah. It's, a, it's the same thing like that, it was neighbors. And then I thought perhaps the, 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 the Rwandan one was much more intelligent than the, the ours because they must have learned things from ours. From ours. But the sad part is that uh, in those community meetings, 
the people in Rwanda, we realize now from the, even the, the UN papers, the people who were lords were leading these, uh, these masses that were killing people gained riches from that themselves because if I know by you are a Hutu and you've got some, some land uh, I, I, I aspire to or some shop, let's go and kill Tembe and then I take that shop mm -hmm. for myself. And then I, they become richer. And then there's the, the, thing, the unfortunate thing about uh, uh, countries like Rwanda, they are like India, they are a case system. Mm -hmm. So uh, a person who is higher blood or who is much more uh, respected is treated as a king or a chief yeah, one is respected. So all they do is to go and attend these cases and sit there and intimidate the people who are supposed to be talking about their pains and buy and buy uh, witnesses. They, they buy witnesses, their own witnesses. They come there and speak on behalf and all that stuff. And then itself it became a shamble. That thing itself was just a shamble. The, the, the people who who had grievances, I mean grave grievances, things they needed to talk, couldn't talk because the enemy was next, uh, sitting next to him. And he knows that the enemy is much more powerful than him. And he's going back to the village next to this man who's got a big house. And this, this man is going to hire men in London as killers to kill me. You understand? And then when after then this thing, I, I've, I've, I've seen it. After all those, those, those testimonies, then when they, 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 they come out, they, mm -hmm. they chew. This, this guy who's got man is dishing them money for not testifying against them. It's nonsensical. And then so I have no, no solution for that. I don't know how it, it could have. <laughs> just, I was just saying that, but this is what happened. You clever guys can think about a, another way of doing it. But they, those ones didn't work. <laughs> Your hand up. Mm. All right, please go ahead. Oh, yes, and then, yeah. Oh, okay. So I just wanted to add and push on the Rwanda. Mm. That's the thread we're on now. Mm. What I like or what I think they did right, um, currently there's an annual remembrance yeah. that they call Kibukwa. Mm. That, that basically means to remember. To remember. And they encourage people to talk about this. Okay, even if it's mostly <coughs> traumatic and to mm. remember, sometimes you don't want to remember, mm. as you say in the book. Mm. Mm. Um, but it's sort of a healing mm. or a platform mm. um, not to forget yeah. about what happened. Because in South Africa, the, conversely, or rather what I see, we're, we're, encouraged, we're encouraged to forget, mm. you know, move on. Mm. This happened a long time ago. Why are you still stuck on apartheid? You've been free for 30 years now. Yeah. Um, forget about it. it and, and that is damaging mm. because we hide the violence, yeah. the pain, yeah. and the trauma. And then all of us just hid under this rainbow and said, reconciliation mm. who was reconciling yeah. like like what are we reconciling mm. like for instance you're gonna ask a mother who lost uh, two boys but now now we are in a new south africa be reconciled she does not even know what happened to her children mm. there's not even a single person who says but oh this is what happened to your children actually we we arrested them and then we killed them while we were brying and then we dumped him on a on a shallow grave somewhere so they are bones, and we're Africans. Guys, we, we, we need the bones of our dead. Five more minutes, yeah, no, sir. according to what I've been told. Uh, sorry, <laughs> one, one question, yeah. okay. because I still want to give and push the last word. Oh, okay, all right. No, yeah. mine is a quick one. Um, so, uh, so push, one of the questions I didn't get to ask last week was around... Um, oh, she was around last week. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, between the covers, people. <laughs> Mm. Um, and there is a move uh, by a lot of African uh, authors, you know, to stay authentic mm. to the language, you know, not to do any translation, and the reader will just mm. figure things out. Yeah. So, the, yeah. So I just wanted to yeah yeah get your stance and how to do you know yeah. the balancing acts. Yeah. 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 Sure. No. Thanks for that question. My method of operation is that uh, if it's somebody's opinion. Uh, 
that is, it's not a dialogue. I will be kind to my reader by somehow translating it, so that even if I sneak the translation, but the reader will know what I'm talking about. But if it's a dialogue, if you would have noticed, you'll see that I just re leave it like that. I don't translate it, because the sense on a dialogue is not necessarily to make you understand what's being said, more than to invoke how it's being said, so that you know, but this is how these people talk. And then as a microcosmos, every second, uh, third word is in English, and we mix everything. And <laughs> we mix everything. <laughs> so, yeah, that's 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 my, that's that, that's how I prefer to operate. But if like a, it's in a discussion, kind of a like a, I'm I'm saying it's not a dialogue. I, I I I because the honest truth, I'm a reader myself. I get irritated too much if the author is writing. Uh, too much about things I don't understand. It just de demotivates me. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I get it, I get it. You, you speak in Igbo, but this is written in English. Now I can't get what you, you are saying. You understand? But I don't mind it on a dialogue if people are talking. Yeah. You understand that? Because I just get the sense of what's being said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I ask you the, my last question um, about the... I mean, I know that the book is not about one thing. It is about many things. One of them, um, being the Broken River Tent, is, I think, sort of Pilar's recognition that although Makoma <coughs> was a hero, he was a flawed man. But the same with uh, Ruru, discovering that although Pagamisa is a hero, uh, he is, in fact, a flawed hero. Mm. So that's my... Uh, take out from both books a, a connecting theme. What is yours? <laughs> yeah, you're right. I don't, I don't like clean characters. <laughs> Especially, I don't like clean heroes. It was the, this unrealistic. There's no, all of us have got our own flaws. And I, I much more uh, like when I have to deal and see the flaws of a character. That makes things more interesting than, uh, yeah. The connecting, uh, I think you always talk about this. For me, I didn't plan this, but the loss is, uh, is a connecting thread of, of, the, of, of, these, of these books. And uh, I don't know if uh, it's because I, I written them at a time where I, like I was losing things on my life. I think when I was writing initially, the, the, the first one, when it was being published, there was a lot of chaos on my life when I was coming back. I felt even career-wise I wasn't where I'm, I, I wanted to be. So I, tran I, I, I gave that sense of uh, confusion and loss into Pillar. This one, by the time it came back, of course, it, it came out, it came out and, uh, at a time that uh, my mother was sick. And then we subsequently lost her. So I t it was natural for me to be preoccupied with the topic of death and I was trying to find out what is what is the purpose of all this thing. You understand? And I didn't want to be talking philosophy, I just wanted a clean answers. Like uh, what is the point to this actual you understand? So yeah, I didn't want didn't want to be talking religion. Yeah, but sometimes and I realize because I'm very particular about that I realize when I've written a sentence and I'm thinking, okay, that's not my sentence. Let me think, where did I get the influence of this? <laughs> you understand? And so now, I would rather be uh, accused of uh, name dropping than plagiarizing. Yeah. So I'm very particular about that. And then I, I always look at, at, at um, sometimes very important writers we, 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 we read. And then I'm like, but that's not your sentence. <laughs> <laughs> and then I read a lot, and then I, I can, and I, I have almost, I, I have almost a photographic memory. And then I, I look, and I'm like, I've, I've seen that sentence before, <laughs> and then it will come to me. But okay, this is how where I've seen. Like for instance, I was saying something. I saw another sentence on a very popular writer, and I'm thinking, I've seen this sentence before. Yeah, that was Kierkegaard. And now this popular writer is, is passing it as his own thought. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is dangerous. So. 
But as a writer, I cannot get into those arguments because people are going to think you are jealous and all those things. So <laughs> I leave that alone. <laughs> I leave that <laughs> so <I'll tell> better. <laughs> mm. My second push, we look forward to your third book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> by the way, by the way, I forgot to say this, and uh, I had a, a feeling that but when you introduced Fanda Camp, you wanted me to talk about this. Uh, to those who don't like Pillar, Pillar is back. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm working on a second book, which is the second of the trilogy that I call The River People. So that now I'm much more looking into the, the clash of spiritualities mm -hmm. since the Broken River Tent was the wars. So now I'm using Teosoga, some will know the first black uh, to be trained in, in, in theology. And then I'm using Fana Camp as the first missionary to go to, to the to Amakos from 1799. And then there's Pila. So Pila uh, is going to be traveling all the places those two were. The interesting part, which is quite nice, it feels like, ah, I was made for this. Because Fana Camp, Fana Camp himself uh, was educated almost on the same universities that Soga was educated in Scotland. And they, Fana Camp, when he landed in South Africa, he landed on the village that Soga was born in. So, wow. yes. so. Yeah, buy the books, guys, those who don't have it. Is <laughs> <laughs> anybody that needs the loo, we've got lots of student volunteers that will guide you around to the Rand Club. Um, and yeah, and hang around afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.